1945, as the Manhattan Project was nearing its big climax, a way was needed to transport the plutonium cores for the implosion-style bombs. The carrying case that resulted is an obscure corner of nuclear history, and I've wanted to make a replica of it for some time. It's such a striking design and absolutely emblematic of a bunch of weird nerds in the desert messing with the fundamental forces of the universe. Halloween 2019 provided a convenient excuse, so with three weeks to spare, I dove in. Unfortunately, very few details about the box have survived, at least publicly. If more exist, it's also classified. The pictures we do have show it in three different settings. First, we see it carried by Herb Lair during the assembly of the Trinity test. Here it appears to be anodized black. We next see it a month later, held by various people on Tinian Island before the Nagasaki bombing, including Larry Johnson, who later went on to teach my dad at the University of Idaho, oddly enough. By this point, it had been painted an ugly mustard yellow, as can be seen in the only color picture we have of it. Finally, a recreation of the Lewis Slotin accident was staged in 1948. The box, which had been carrying the demon core, shows up in the background of the pictures. By this point, several of the bumpers had been replaced with black ones, and it looks like something had been attached with wire, maybe? There is also a brief description of it in a book written by Ralph Sparks, who did most of the actual machining. This was written several decades later, however, and not all of the details it gives line up with the photographic evidence, so I couldn't completely trust it. And that's it. That's all that Alex Wellerstein has been able to find, anyway, whose research I was basing all this on. It was his blog that got me obsessed with the artifact in the first place. The real thing is lost to history, probably moldering away in a radioactive waste up at Los Alamos, though I'd like to think that it was taken to a government warehouse to drain the Ark of the Covenant and other dangerous relics. But either way, we're lucky that the Herb Lair picture is fairly high quality, and it captures one of the faces nearly orthogonally. Using this and Sparks' description, I worked out the dimensions of all the other features. These fit pretty well with natural-feeling English units, as one would expect. Lots of quarter and half-inch features, etc. Using those measurements, I built a CAD model in SOLIDWORKS. Unfortunately, some details simply were not visible. How the handle attaches is largely guesswork on my part. The four caps, which look to my eyes like they're made of aluminum, remain fairly mysterious. Sparks mentions creating four cavities for the initiator spheres, informally called urchins. I'm assuming these caps had something to do with this, though why they needed four initiators is itself perplexing. It's not like you could just swap one out if it proved to be a dud. Likewise, how the top and bottom halves of the body were connected is unclear. Sparks says there were four bolt holes in the corners, so I used the urchin caps as nuts, but that's certainly wrong. In one of the Slotin pictures, it looks like the interior is largely hollow, but beyond that it's a complete mystery. I decided not to worry about the interior details too much and just focus on the exterior. I wanted the replica to be as faithful as possible, but sadly that couldn't extend to materials. Obviously I wasn't going to get my hands on two plutonium hemispheres of any size, much less the 92 millimeters that would be most correct. Tungsten is a very close match in terms of density, but the next size down, 3 inches, was already far too expensive. Getting one custom made would have cost thousands. I ended up going with a 3.5 inch ball bearing, which was within 3% of the correct diameter, but weighed less than half as much as the original cores. It also didn't keep itself at a toasty 100 degrees Fahrenheit like the originals did. That heat from the decay of the plutonium was the reason for the unusual material choice of the original. Magnesium, because of its thermal conductivity properties. This posed a problem for the replica because that much magnesium would be very expensive to buy. And machining magnesium poses some unique challenges of the kind that can melt a hole through your mill and or burn your house down. I seriously considered aluminum, but even that was going to be more than I really wanted to spend. I don't have a way to weld aluminum at the moment, so I would have had to make it out of a single billet. Steel was right out due to weight and machining time concerns. In the end, I decided to lean into the prop replica side of things and try out run shape. This is a modeling material I learned about from Adam Savage videos, and I had been curious about what it was like to work with. It's best thought of as an artificial wood, I think. It's not cheap, but still not as expensive as metal would have been. 
Wren shape makes quite a mess being machined, it turns out, throwing off loads of crumbly and staticky little chips. But it machines beautifully. I was taking cuts over a quarter inch deep, turning the hand wheels on the mill as fast as they would go, and it still left a beautiful finish. The only thing to look out for was a tendency to chip out when exiting a cut. According to Sparks' account, there was a spherical cavity in the middle of the box for the plutonium core. His description makes it sound like a complete hemisphere cut into each half, though, which makes no sense when you imagine trying to get the core out. There would be no way to pick up the lower hemisphere. So I only cut the spherical cavity on the bottom section, and only about an inch deep, so there was still plenty of space to get your fingers around the very heavy core sitting there. To make this cavity, I had to bodge together a simple ball turning attachment from an old fly cutter. It worked quite well in the softer end shape. I think with a bit of tweaking, I could make the general design work for soft metals like aluminum and brass. In the upper body section, I bored out a cylindrical cavity for the core. It was too deep to make with the ball turner, and I wanted to leave some room above the core anyway. I was hoping to be able to pack some hand warmers in there to keep the core warm to the touch, but that didn't end up working. They need a floor of oxygen to keep the reaction going, it turns out, and the thermal mass of all that steel was too much for them anyway. The original handle was from a piece of test equipment, according to Sparks. I did some image searches for 30s and 40s oscilloscopes and such, but I never found a match. Instead, I traced the outline and got it water jet cut out of stainless steel. With some sanding and filing, this ended up looking pretty slick. Stainless is a pain to work with, but I do love how it looks when you're done. The scales on the handle look to be in two sections, so I replicated that as closely as possible. The Delrin plastic I used was an anachronism, but I didn't want to deal with Bakelite or whatever it actually would have been. Delrin also machines super easily, so it was pretty fun cutting a little radius on the edges and counterboring the holes for the screw posts I used to attach them. The handle attaches to the body through L-blocks by means of custom bolts. Sadly, I've never gotten the hang of reliable knurling, but they work okay. The details here were largely guesswork on my part, as only the L-block is visible in any of the pictures. The urchin caps are simple aluminum stepped cylinders, turned on the lathe. A lot of material to remove, but otherwise very straightforward. I threaded them all the way through, as later pictures show rubber bumpers attached to these as well, even though they're missing in the Trinity picture. The caps also serve in my version as the nuts for long threaded rods which hold the top of the body to the bottom section. When finishing the top of the box, I carefully bored out cavities of the exact same thickness so they would sit flush with the top. The final machining task was to make the rubber bumpers. Spark says these were bottle stoppers from their chemistry lab, cryogenically machined with liquid nitrogen. I'd been wanting an excuse to play with cryogenic machining, so I was really looking forward to this part. I decided to go with dry ice and a denatured alcohol bath instead of liquid nitrogen, as that was easier to pick up on my way home on the bus. Once rigid from the cold, the rubber proved very easy to machine. It made these weird chips that did tend to jam up in the flutes of an end mill, though. Each bumper stayed cold long enough to get the hole drilled and the counterbar made if I didn't mess around. Honestly, I probably could have just stuck them in the freezer overnight, and then my shop wouldn't have smelled like a frat party. The last detail was the lab thermometer that was mounted in the top of the original. This was used to make sure that the pit wasn't overheating from its own decay energy. Luckily, these haven't changed much over the last 80 years, and the popularity of home brewing makes them cheap and easy to acquire. And with a slightly rushed paint job, the box was done. I decided to go with the black anodization seen in the earliest version of the box, with the white bumpers on the sides and bottom, but not the top. Despite being made of such a light material, overall it has a very nice heft with the steel core in place. It weighs 9.5 kilograms, 21 pounds, which is probably a bit light, but it's hard to say without knowing exactly how solid the interior of the original was. One interesting detail that reveals itself during assembly was that the rubber bumpers get distorted as they are screwed down. The measurements from the layer picture didn't really match any of the standard bottle stopper sizes, which as far as I know were already standardized by 1945. But squished by the screw, they are a bit shorter and a bit stouter, and they match the picture much more closely. I love little details like that, which can only be learned by actually making a physical item. 
So that's it, my 2019 Halloween costume. Though, yes, it is really just a standalone prop. It was the Pandora's box of the 20th century. It was a satanic reliquary for the heart of the most infamous gadget ever made. And it's hard to get much scarier than that, I think.